Hello, welcome to Jerusalem, the holy city. On Friday, September the 4th, 1523, Ignatius and a group of few other pilgrims entered the walls of the city, welcomed by a procession of Franciscans. The journey had been long and not without perils. Ignatius had left the port of Barcelona on March the 20th to reach the Italian port of Gaeta between Naples and uh, Rome. Just five days later, favored as well as endangered by strong winds and storms. Concerns about the plog in the city pushed some passengers on their way directly to Rome. One group included Ignatius, a woman with a daughter and a son. Nighttime Ignatius' intervention saved the two women from rapists at an inn where they had decided to stop by. The journey continued to Rome, where he obtained the papal permit to get to the Holy Land. And from there, 600 kilometers walking northward to Venice, the gateway to East and Asia, and the port from where the vessel to the Holy Land were annually organized. Now, luckily enough, we have a first-hand testimony of Ignatius's travel, as two of his companions in the pilgrimage, the Swiss art artillery caster Peter Fusli and Philip Hagen of Strasbourg, kept diaries that remained. Hagen begins his diary with a statement that is quite significant about the troubles a pilgrim should expect during his journey to the Holy Land. He said, Whoever desires to see the Holy Sepulchre must provide himself with three large bags, one well filled with ducats and coins, another full of patience, and a third full of faith. The organization of a pilgrimage at that time required money, as trips, provisions, lodging, guides were all bought for free. Moreover, many places were under the govern of the Ottoman Empire, and Turks were those guards and military staff who would manage, sometimes in a rough way, sometimes asking for undue tips, the movement of the pilgrims once in the Holy Land. Ignatius and this group, mind how international it was, four Spaniards, three Swiss, one Tyrolese, two Germans, eleven Flemish and Dutch, embarked on the ship Negrona, which was carrying the new Venetian ambassador Nicola Dolphin to Cyprus and reached the known port of Famagosta on August the 14th, after a month of sailing. Then the pilgrims had to walk to the eastern port of Larnaca, where they finally took the final lift to the Israeli port of Jaffa. They were allowed to land on August the 31st, and from there they pointed to Ramla and Jerusalem riding donkeys. The Franciscans, who had the custody of the Holy Land, picked them up at the gates of the city and offered shelter and help. What did Ignatius visit here? On the morning of September the 5th, after hearing Mass at the convent of Mount Zion, they walked in, in procession with lighted candles to the Cenacle, where they recalled the Last Supper and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Then they moved to the church of the Dormition of Our Lady. In the afternoon, they visited the Holy Sepulchre, which they spent, where they spent the whole night in vigil. Before dawn, they made the confession and received communion. At six in the morning, the basilica was closed and the pilgrim had to go back to their hotel for rest. That afternoon, they walked the way of the cross, with its clearly indicated stations from the Tower Antonia to Calvary and the Holy Sepulchre. Then they visited Bethany and the Mount of Olives. Then they visited Bethlehem and the Valley of Josephat and the Garden of Gethsemane. They visited Jericho and the Jordan River. Fusli's account became famous also because it brought back uh, an imaginary rose from the city of Jericho, a rose that he passed to his descendants. They bathed quickly in the Jordan River, and uh, uh, they they uh, when they climbed uh, the mountain uh, uh, of the Savior's forty-day fast. 
Now, the big point of the story here in Jerusalem is that, as Ignatius recollects in his autobiography, the pilgrimage was not meant to end for him. He says he firmly wanted to stay here, keep him visiting the holy places. He says that this was his plan from the very beginning and that he brought letters of recommendation for, with him to ask the Franciscans for allowing him to stay. Wasn't for the superior provincial of the Franciscans, who firmly refused, the Society of Jesus would not be probably here today. Ignatius was denied remaining and, after a couple of secret detours, slipping from the watch of the custodians to visit again the Mount of Olives, he had to manage his return to Spain, which was to be as dangerous as the first round, by the way. Now, we see here the initial resolution that Ignatius made during his recovery days back in Loyola was fulfilled, and his later emphasis on his desire of remaining a pilgrim in the Holy Land with the idea of staying close to the Holy and help souls there might be a sign for us that the question was again haunting his mind. And now what? Once again, we see him adjusting to a new course of life, changing the plan. Certainly, his illumination in Maresa had provided him with the spiritual and cultural framework to undergo a new, fresh beginning, as we will see once he gets back to Barcelona. But it is also true that Jerusalem, the Holy Land, its multicultural population and the idea that of the work of evangelization of non-Christians, and particularly the Muslims living here around, remained a steady, core dimension of the vocation he would keep experiencing in his future choices. At this time, 1523, Ignatius is a pilgrim with no Latin at all and extemporary companions in the Holy Land. Just a decade later, we will find him in Paris, France, taking a vow on the hill of Montmartre to come back now with 10 true companions and friends, all students and grads of the University of Paris. Will this companionship achieve its goal? What will happen to them? The story and our pilgrimage continues. Time for me to pack up and get back to Barcelona. I will see you there in the charming and narrow streets of the Barrio Gotico. Welcome, pilgrims, to Jerusalem. And as you've learned from Professor Cristiano Casolini, Jerusalem was the vision, the destination that St. Ignatius was seeking. And as you know, too, this destination, which seemed to Ignatius to be an end in itself, actually becomes a means to an even greater end. It's interesting, isn't it, that Jerusalem is the location that we find ourselves in after having spent the past week in Manresa. Part of St. Ignatius's vision was to go to Jerusalem to spend his life in service there. And as you know from the autobiography, things changed for Ignatius. And the possibility of Jerusalem as his final destination, was no longer feasible. He had to open himself up to new possibilities, and his being open to new possibilities led to an entirely different trajectory, one that gave birth to the Society of Jesus. Given this context, I'd like to speak to you for a bit about the theme that accompanies Jerusalem, and that theme is the holy. It seems to me that when we speak about the holy, when we speak of holiness, we're pointing towards something of deep reverence, where we have some dimension of the palpable presence of God in our lives. I think about the, the being present 
at a Catholic mass in a beautiful church where the stained glass windows reflect the sunlight and the music lifts high into the interior space with grace and reverence. In such an environment, I become very aware of the presence of all sorts of people, of how all of us in this space are absolutely united in our love of God, our awareness of his very presence in this sacred space. I become aware that a dimension of the mystical body of Jesus is revealing itself in this very space at this very moment. Such an experience for me is utterly holy. I think about being in the woods, gazing out upon a beautiful lake at sunset with the whisper of the air, the silencing of the birds, the stillness of the trees, all of creation is pausing as the water reflects the sun, gently disappearing, each ray glimmering upon the water as dusk slowly takes hold of the emerging night. Such a moment for me is utterly holy. You see, the possibility of holiness is all around us. God cries out through all things, through all that is, because of his desire to get our attention so that we receive his love. We believe that God is incarnate, that the person of Jesus is God revealing himself to us in order to communicate unconditional love with the desire that we offer a return of love. It seems that there are moments where holiness enters into our lives in surprising ways, where the plans that we have have been disrupted and life invites us to change. This week, you might spend some time reflecting on two sets of moments in your life. First, use the gift of memory to recall moments where you felt clearly that you were in the midst of holiness. As you look back, what does that experience or those experiences signify for your journey in life. I believe that it's pleasing to God when we recall such moments. I also believe that recalling moments like these strengthens our interior lives, for we are then reminded that God is faithful and good, and that this reassurance gives us the courage to continue to propel forward with eagerness and receptivity to the unknowns of the future. Second, use the gift of memory to recall moments where your plans, important as they were, and as well thought out as they were, suddenly became no longer feasible and you had to make a change. What was that like for you? Chances are that in the moment you felt some disappointment, some disappointments, perhaps. For a reflective person, such interruptions in time 
become moments that are key in the story, in the narrative of one's life. With reflection and grace, our disappointments can become transformed <clears throat> into possibility, adventure, opportunity. And we sense often, in hindsight, that there was something holy in our midst. The presence of God. If we think about Jesus' Jerusalem, it is on the one hand the place of his triumphant success, his entrance into triumph, the pinnacle of influence, the place of his very successful and transformative ministry. Then suddenly, Jerusalem becomes the place of defeat, of failure, and demise. And then, Jerusalem becomes the place of life, resurrection, possibility. Everything changes because God is there through it all. Holiness can bear surprises in life, and these surprises contain within them the mystery of God's fidelity and our ability to pivot with what life brings. We look forward to seeing you next week in Barcelona. Have a great week of pilgrimage.